Hey, welcome back to your favorite uh, calculus class. We're going to take a look at continuity today. Let me show you the graph for a little uh, explanation for this. You know, a lot of the time when we plot uh, functions, maybe we've collected some data and we've plotted a, a point, you know, a lot of time, you know, in the field and everyday life, we'll connect those plotted points. You know, we have, we have these points and then we kind of connect them in, in order to interpolate or extrapolate based on the data. So what we're doing is we're assuming we have a continuous function. In other words, its outputs vary regularly and consistently with these inputs. We don't jump abruptly from one value to another. It's not discrete, right? It doesn't just jump. <clears throat> so what is a continuous function? Well, continuous function informally means No holes, no gaps, no jumps. A lot of the times it's easier to see. Um, it, well, and, and a lot of the time you may have heard this in, in middle or high school. You have to be able to draw that function without lifting your pencil. Right? That would be a continuous function. I, I can draw it without lifting my pencil so this one is not continuous obviously because we've got the gap here we've got a jump here in other words instead of being defined here it's defined up here so it you know you've got that jump right there you got another jump right here so it's, it's not continuous at any of those x values at one two or four because i had to lift my pencil to draw that thing again no holes no gaps no jumps. Um, let's go to a little more formality with our definition. So first of all, no holes. And you see that graph there, you know, you cannot have a hole because you must be. So formally speaking, when we say no holes what we mean what we mean is um, f of c must be defined the second requirement to be continuous uh, no gaps okay, you notice the gap right there so we have you know, whatever your function looks like. Here's an example of a gap. So you cannot have gaps. In other words, the limit as x goes to c of this function must exist. Okay, so formally, it must be defined, no holes. Number two is can't have any gaps. The limit must exist. Right? In other words, the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit have to agree. And then thirdly, not only must the limit exist, uh, the limits must equal the functional value. So no jumps in, in what's being defined. Right? So you have you know, some... Here's an example of a jump. It's defined right down here. And by the way, this is C. Now, this is C on all these. Okay. So no jumps. So the limit as x goes to C of this function must also equal the point, right? So this is why it's not continuous. No holes. So this is this right here. Is, you know, it's got to be defined. In other words, no holes. Formally, the limit must exist. In other words, no gaps. And finally, the limit must equal the actual functional value. So we can't have any jumps either. Okay. So that's your formal definition of being of a function being continuous. No holes, no gaps, no jumps. There's the formality. Again, no holes, no gaps, no jumps there. All right, so a function is continuous if we have no holes, no gaps, no jumps, right? But we can also talk about 
one-sided continuity. So you can be right continuous to see if the limit as you approach C from the right equals the functional value. You can be left-hand continuous. Sometimes it's easier to see the visual on these. If the limit as X goes to C from the left is equal to the functional value. So here, here's an example. So at A, we are continuous from the right. In other words, as we approach A from the right, right, the limit as X approaches A from the right of this functional value is F of A. And over here, we're continuous from the left. So the limit as X approaches B from the left of this functional is actually equal to the functional value there. So we're continuous only from the left. There's nothing over here. I can't approach it from the right. So this is, again, is only continuous from the left there. So this function here, as I approach negative two, I'm gonna be continuous where? From the left, right? Continuous from the right, left. Whereas at two, I am, oh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, I said that wrong, my goodness. Apologies here. For negative two, where are we coming from? We're coming from the right. So we are right hand continuous here, right? As we approach negative two. Whereas for two, we are left hand continuous. We're coming from the left hand side there. So this is just an example of a. Um, now, your authors will call this a jump discontinuity. Most textbooks will, or many textbooks will call that a gap. Uh, because the limit, the problem is the limit as x approaches c, c here being the origin, uh, does not exist here. Right? The overall limit, the two-sided limit. All right, so let's look at here. Um, let's see if these are continuous uh, when we're looking at zero. So for a, notice I can draw this without lifting my pencil. At zero, yes, we are continuous. So this one's continuous. Can draw that without lifting my pencil. This one, no, not continuous. I've got a hole. In other words, f of c is not defined, right? Here, even though I have a limit, I've got a jump. I've got a jump here. So this is not continuous either. Again, I have to be able to draw without lifting my pencil. Here, I've got a gap, right? The limit does not exist at zero. Here, um, we, we've got, uh, notice, I don't even, it's not even defined. I can't even put zero in here, right? I've got this, I've got this verbal, I, I'm sorry, I've got this vertical asymptote right there. And then finally over here, same thing. What we've, we've got this oscillating, but X is, is not defined either here. We can't have a zero on the bottom there. We can't have a defined or something that's not defined. They're not continuous for this, those. Now, if F and G are continuous, like let's say f is x squared, and we, which we know, you know, that's continuous, right? If I was to draw x squared, we know x cubed is continuous as well. So if I was to add those up, this function is also continuous. If I was to subtract two continuous functions, those they're still continuous. Right? If I take k times a continuous function, like three times x squared. That's still continuous, right? It's still continuous. Notice that little vertical stretch to the maximum. Products would be continuous. F over G is continuous as long as the uh, denominator there is not equal to zero. It will be continuous everywhere else. Powers, if n is positive integer, and so on. Yeah. Now, if F is continuous to C and G is continuous to C, then G of F is continuous as c so composites would be continuous okay. all right so this plays into the intermediate value theorem that discussion on continuous functions the intermediate value theorem says um, and I, i've shorthanded it here if f is continuous so that's first and foremost so i gotta have no holes no gaps no jumps on this closed interval from a to b where f of a does not equal f of b if k is less than or equal to f of b and greater than or equal to f of a, then that means there exists, if you're not familiar with that, there exists a c 
that's in, in other words, an element of that's in this interval from A to B, such that, such that, f of c equals k. Let's see if we can make some sense of this. Okay. So first of all, um, we've got this, we've got this continuous function. All right. Uh, we've got this continuous function. Um, got this continuous function. Let me put a here. Let me put b here. Okay. So this thing's continuous from a to b, a closed interval. And notice f of a. So here's a f of a. Right? There's my oops. There's my f of a. Here's my point b f of b. There's my y value right there. Okay. So um, notice f of a not equal f of b, right? Those two different y values. If k is between there, so we have some k value that's between them, between f of a and f of b, like maybe f of a is 1, f of b is 5, maybe, maybe k is like 2.5, whatever it is, but it's between them. It's some y value between them, okay? is between them and it's actually less than or equal to okay. then this is saying then there must exist a c there must exist some input between a and b such that f of c is actually equal to that k so there's got to be some input and that input's going to be between a and b so this C F of C point right here. Oops, don't let me draw it. Come on, let me draw it. C F of C. So that F of C is equal to the K. All right. So that's all it's saying. That's all the intermediate value theorem is saying. If you've got a continuous function on A to B, K is smashed between those two Y values and and then there, there must be a corresponding input that guarantees that the f of c is equal to that k. Okay. Um, so this is this is just an existence theorem. So how how can you think of that in everyday real life? Well, <clears throat> let's say a person's height. Let's say you've got this girl. She's she's five feet tall on her 13th birthday, but on her 14th birthday, she's five foot seven. Right. So this is saying. Hey, this girl's five foot on her 13th year, but her 14th year, this girl's five foot seven now, right? So she, she grew, however, however she grew, okay? Then at some point, Right, any height between here, like it, in in other words, like at some point I'll pick a height. She was five foot two, sometime between there. You know, maybe it was when she was thirteen point four, you know, four tenths of a year more. In her thirteen point fourth year, if you will, right. That's what that's what that intermediate value theorem is saying because we know this is continuous, right? You grow continuous. So it seems reasonable enough. So it guarantees the existence. In mathematics, a lot of the time we'll we'll find values such as a zero. Okay, but if you're not continuous, the problem is, right? Like this one, we've got this gap here. There's no way we're ever going to hit this y value of k because this thing's going to be there's you know it's not continuous. So you, you must have continuous when you're analyzing uh, the intermediate value theorem. So it can be used to locate zeros, as I mentioned. So it'll guarantee the existence of. Let's do one like that. Use the intermediate value theorem uh, to show that the polynomial function has a zero in the interval here shown. So what we're going to do is we're going to think to ourselves, well, first of all, uh, getting Intermediate value theorem. Let's let's use this as kind of our blueprint here. This intermediate value theorem says uh, let 
f b continuous on closed interval a to b And by the way, some textbooks will not require f of a to not be equal to f of b. You, you could actually, they can be equal. Again, it depends on your textbook on that, if they want to require that or not. And the reason is you could have, you could have a constant function, right? So you could have a equaling f of a equaling f of b. So k would have to be the same value, still guarantees an existence of C there. Okay. So, so, so C equals K. Okay, so uh, let's think about this X cubed plus two X plus one. How, how, how can we kind of think about uh, this function here? So our answer, first of all, we gotta say, is this thing continuous? Well, it's a cubic, it's, this is polynomial. So since F is a polynomial, it's continuous on, and this is our A and B from zero to one. All right, I, I don't know what this thing looks like, but put one out here. It's continuous on zero to one. And we know f of zero is not equal to f of one. How do we know that? Well, I'm going to plug it in. If I have f of x equals x cubed plus two x plus one, f of zero must be one f of 1 ends up being 4. Okay. So 1 cubed plus 2. We have 3 minus 1. Oh my gosh. Sorry. Uh, we got 2. <laughs> so, <clears throat> since, and I'm going to keep going now. So I'm right here. I'm trying to remember. I'm trying to show it has a 0. I'm trying to show. I have an x-intercept, right? And I know at f of 0, um, I've got negative 1. My gosh, how many times am I going to screw this up? This is a minus. It would help if I wrote that out. It's a minus 1. So this is a negative 1. I apologize. So at 0, I actually hit negative 1. Okay. At 1, I'm hitting 2. Let me kind of draw, try and draw this a little better for you here. Hitting up here at 2. So it's going something like this. Sorry about that. So what are we trying to show? We're trying to show we have a zero. So our k, we're trying to show we hit a y value of zero. So since f of zero, so since zero is less than or equal to f of one, which is greater than or equal to f of zero, in other words, i.e., uh, when I plugged in zero, I got negative one. So we know zero is between those two y values, right? Because I had zero and negative one. So I'm going from this y value up to that y value. So I know this is continuous. It's got to cross, right? It's got it's got to hit. It's got to have a zero there. So then there must exist a c. In this interval from 0 to 1, that's our a to b, right? In that, there must be some input in there such that f of c equals k. What's our k? 0. We're just trying to show that it hits a y value. So this is our c right there. All right? We're just trying to show that it hits the x-axis there. And that's how you use the intermediate value theorem to, to do that. Okay? It's called an existence theorem. And you know what? In your, in your, in your book, let me show you a couple of things. Uh, 
So over here, we pull up distance. You can get a, a graphical look at some of these. In fact, let me let me take a different function. Let's say I have um, x cubed minus 8x minus 5. And let's say it's asking us to find a 0 uh, between negative 4 and negative 2 and um, to four decimal places. Notice this will this will automatically take it to three decimal places. So if it says use your graphing calculator to approximate to three or four decimal places, you can zoom in on these. Just FYI, if you're using decimals, zoom in a little bit more until you get, there you go, 2.4393. Now you've got it approximated to four decimal places if you're, if you're using decimals. Um, another thing I should, I should mention vocabulary wise, um, let me click. Um, let me just use this right here. This, you know, when we had the situation, draw here, where we had a jump. Okay. This, so in other words, the limit as x approaches c of the function is not equal to the functional value. Let's see, yeah, there's that jump right there. Um, this is called a removable. Discontinuity, if you get, if you get asked about that. A removable discontinuity. In other words, it can be it can be repaired uh, simply by filling in the hole, right? In other words, we fill this in, you heard of that. So that's called a removable discontinuity because the limit exists. You know, the limit is whatever the y value is initially, even though the functional value but it wasn't equal to the functional value. Again, that's a removable discontinuity. So if you see that jump, that's a removable discontinuity. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you guys next time.